Welcome back, everyone, and welcome also to our viewers on Facebook Live and YouTube. Tonight, I am inviting you to take part in our panel discussion. We're asking if anyone should lose their job over allegations of sexual harassment, allegations alone. This in the wake of several politically high-profile and powerful men who have left their positions because of allegations of sexual misconduct. Federal Cabinet Minister Kent Hare, Nova Scotia Conservative Leader Jamie Bailey, and also in the middle of the night last night, Ontario Conservative Leader Patrick Brown quit after allegations of sexual misconduct were made against him. For his part, it sounded like he didn't want to go. He says he is innocent. Today, reporters were asking if it was right that Brown should be forced out because of unproven allegations. Are, are you saying that uh, he should not have due process, uh, that he is guilty, uh, you know, not innocent? Uh, I, I mean, essentially, he has lost his entire career here because of these allegations, these, report, these reports from these two women. Quite the opposite. If you read our statement from last night, it clearly says that he has uh, the opportunity and he must have his opportunity to, to defend. What we need to do as a party is say we cannot have that hanging over our heads while we prepare for the June 2018 election. And then, just hours ago, another politician resigned. Kent Hare, Minister for Sports and People with Disabilities, stepping down from Trudeau's cabinet. The former minister allegedly made sexually inappropriate comments to women when he was in the Alberta legislature. He is the third politician in two days to be accused of misconduct. As I said earlier this week, Nova Scotia's progressive conservative leader, Jamie Bailey, forced out over allegations of sexual misconduct. And again, we are taking your comments and questions, as many as we can get to tonight. Join the conversation going to facebook.com slash CBC News. You can also watch on CBC's YouTube and Twitter pages. In Ottawa, let me introduce our panel. In Ottawa, Tim Powers, Vice President of Summa Strategies. Also in Ottawa, John Ibbotson, columnist for the Globe and Mail. In Toronto, Munuza Sheikh, an employment lawyer and partner at Levitt LLP. John, I'll begin with you, you today. In your column, you address this today in the Globe. You say the world will take note of Patrick Brown's situation tonight, and there are a lot of men no longer sleeping well tonight. Well, I think because it's, it, it, this is certainly true, uh, we have had some high-profile resignations in the political arena. Uh, I'm thinking especially of uh, Senator Franken in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, but this is a, a, a rare case of a senior politician, uh, someone who was probably headed towards becoming Premier of Ontario, whose entire career is destroyed in a matter of hours because of allegations of sexually inappropriate behavior. I've never seen a career implode with the speed that Patrick Brown's career imploded with uh, last night. And indeed, uh, the international media has been reporting on it uh, through the day. Do you think that it's right that someone's career can be, can be destroyed just on allegations alone? Look, if this were a regular workplace and the mm -hmm. Human Resources Department uh, were in charge, there would be the process in place to investigate uh, the allegations, but politics is not an ordinary environment. It is an entirely public environment. Uh, these allegations are serious. They were investigated and reported by uh, CTV, for whom I have the greatest respect. Um, and the st the senior staff of the leader said to him that he must resign or they would resign, and when he wouldn't, they did, which again lends credibility. Um, and yes, we have had enough years where women came forward with allegations that mm -hmm. were either dismissed or explained away or a rap on the knuckles and nothing happened and then other women kept quiet because why go through all that grief for nothing. Um, I am on the side of those who say it is time we put some credence into those who are making those allegations and uh, uh, especially in the, in the political sphere mm. it, it, it is in, inconceivable that the Progressive Conservative Party could have that leader uh, with them going into the next election. Okay. They, they had no choice and he had to go. Okay, Jesse Gilley is actually saying what choice does the guy have regardless yeah. of guilt <laughs> when we're this close to an election? Tim. 
And he's right. And Patrick Brown said as much, Carol, in his statement when he finally did resign three and a half hours after that news conference. He said no one person is bigger than the PC party of Ontario and the mission to defeat Kathleen Wynne is more important than him. Uh, he of all people would know that this debate about whether you should have due process or not is an important one, but there was no choice in those circumstances. He does have a latter day due process uh, for all intents and purposes. As John says, it does look like his career right now is ruined, though it must be said he's still a member of the provincial parliament and still collecting a paycheck. But I think the question's a good one because look at the three cases you mentioned. So the Jamie Bailey one in Nova Scotia is very different. They went through an investigative process. The a complaint was received, and, and Manusha can speak to this better than I can, but a complaint was received through a mechanism that existed. That complaint was investigated by a third party. The third party provided the results to the appropriate decision-making authorities, and an action was taken thereafter. One assumes that action was asking Mr. Bailey to resign, which I believe is standard in these cases, or being fired. So due process did appear to be in place there. With Mr. Hare, it's a bit backwards, but there is still a process. According to the Prime Minister, he's taking a leave of absence and stepping out of Cabinet while they undergo an investigation. As David said to you in the earlier report, the Prime Minister rightly has been credited with having processes in place to deal with these sorts of things. But sometimes, again, to quote Patrick Brown, uh, and a hothouse of, of the electoral environment that is Ontario public opinion rule moves faster than any court does. Okay, Manuza is the employment lawyer here. What, uh, you know, what's your thought of this? Should sexual allegations, allegations alone, cost anyone their job? It absolutely can cost you your job, and I'll tell you why. If what you're doing, even if those allegations haven't been corroborated, and we've seen obviously with sexual harassment allegations, whether they're raised in the political environment or whether they're raised in a in a workplace, um, and particularly when they're very dated allegations, it takes a long time to investigate those. But where they fly in the face of the core values of the company that you work for, or in this case, fly in the face of the core values of the Conservative Party, absolutely, um, you know, that gives that party, and in, you know, in the case of employment, it would give the employer the right to say, we simply can't keep you on board anymore, which is precisely what happened with the Conservative Caucus. Now, I will say that, like, I did personally find all of this to be extremely disheartening. I'm sure I don't stand alone in saying that, particularly because, and, you know, the irony of the statement is not lost on me, as a woman, as a, and as a woman of colour, um, and as a woman who identifies as a Muslim Canadian, you know, Patrick Brown, I think, did a lot about uh, tra a lot um, in terms of transforming the uh, provincial conservative party definitely making it more of a moderate platform and attracting a lot of uh, individuals from different ethnic uh, from different ethnic backgrounds and a lot of women so I find it to be extremely disheartening I t I absolutely note the fact that these allegations are un you know not substantiated but you know in John's wor uh, words I also have a lot of respect for CTV and there was some due diligence there mm -hmm. um, does that meet the legal standard is it the same test? Absolutely not. Now, with Kent Hair, Carol, I have to say, and again, a lot of this is conjecture, I find it very peculiar that he has resigned before the investigation. And as a lawyer who has oftentimes uh, been involved in these investigations when there's, you know, allegations of impropriety raised in the workplace, and specifically when they're of a sexual nature, I got to tell you, Carol, you know, we start going through the emails and we start going mm -hmm. through the notes. So I almost wonder um, if this wasn't, uh, you know, a move on Kent Hare's part preemptively and maybe wisely to say, okay, stop the investigation, I'm leaving, because the reality is we don't know what's going to come up once they actually delve into that investigation. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at his statement, and I noted that uh, he said he didn't want to be a distraction to all the good work being done by the government, um, and the conversation is a very important one. Encourage all women who felt uncomfortable to continue to come forward. It's never okay, uh, but there's no, there's no denial inside of the statement from Kent Hare today. He says he will stay on pending an investigation, so we'll see what comes of that. Um, all right, so on the point of somebody's career going up in flames like this, Renata Bates on our bets on Facebook says, women also kept quiet because their careers would have been ruined just as quickly as Mr. Brown's had been. Feel free to weigh in, anyone.
I think that really undermines the concept of positional power. So while I don't disagree with her statement, I think women historically have kept silent about what happens in the workplace because there's huge issues around positional power. And mm -hmm. this relates again to Patrick Brown's case as well. We have a staffer saying, look, you know, it was 10 years ago, I was very early on in my career, and I simply felt like I couldn't say anything. In fact, she felt so stilted in being able to communicate, um, you know, what she had gone through. She came back to work the next summer. So again, I want to see more of a discussion around positional power as it relates to this issue. Amir, yeah, there's a, oh, sorry, Kara, yeah, can I just say there's, sure. an, there's another element to it that you, you played one clip from uh, from that news conference earlier today that I think requires more scrutiny, and that is what actually did senior leadership or, or key people in the PC Party of Ontario know? Uh, the journalists who were posing the question raised uh, an important one, which is something was well trafficked here. I'm sure John heard it, others heard it, you no doubt heard it in Toronto. There were constant suggestions, and we all know gossip uh, flow, flows the rivers of politics, but there was constant suggestions that it was only an, an inevitability that a story of some magnitude surrounding Patrick Brown's personal life was going to cause significant political damage to him. Um, it is hard for me to reconcile that somebody in the in the PC Party of Ontario wasn't asking some questions somewhere about all of that, and that g then gets to. Do the, do the systems exist? Do the structural processes exist provincially? They've just been created federally in response to different allegations of sexual harassment that have come forward. And I think for the future prospects of the PC Party of Ontario, they're going to have to let the sunlight shine in here and answer those questions and dig a little bit deeper and build a system, if one doesn't exist already, to deal with uh, creating a platform for people who uh, feel they ought to complain to allow them to do that in a, in a manner that has their grievances and their mistreatment uh, addressed properly. I think that will be addressed, but I know John hasn't said anything, so I, I, I've got something to say on this. I don't know if he wants to jump in first. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so, and, and you know, I, I, I've done a few interviews today, and, and, I, and the, again, conjecture on my part, but my mm -hmm. sense is that we might see something similar like Bill C-65 come down the pipeline. Because you'll, you'll remember that when Bill C-65 came down the pipeline, very recently, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the sexualized, uh, the political sexualized environment and how sexual harassment is prevalent on the Hill and how these staffers do not have, um, you know, any sort of legal recourse. So I think now with this incident taking place with Patrick Brown, I would not be surprised at all if um, Kathleen Wynne or maybe our, uh, you know, maybe the Conservative caucus is going to mm -hmm. come up with some sort of policy and recourse to say we've alleviated this issue. Staffers now do have some legal recourse. I really do see that coming down the pipeline. And you know what, Carol, it's going to be before this provincial election. Erwin Smith oh. says, I believe Patrick is innocent. Hopefully he will adopt the Mike Pence rule from now on. Obviously uh, referring, I assume, referring to the fact that Mike Pence will not be alone in the room with a woman. Mm -hmm. Well, look, um, I don't want to speak to the issue of, uh, or I, I'm not qualified to speak to the issue as a lawyer of, of workplace harassment, but I, I have a bit of experience as, as a reporter and as, as a journalist. And, and two things have to be said here. First of all, circumstances matter. Mm -hmm. uh, if this had been an allegation level, leveled <coughs> against Patrick Brown three years before the next election, um, if it had been leveled in um, a news organization whose bona fides were not as, as solid as those of CTV, we might be saying something different. We might be saying something like, you know, let the process play out, let's give this time. The fact is, it's just reality. It happened literally weeks yeah. before the election campaign is to begin. The party had to make a decision. So we're always going to have to make, mm -hmm. you know, value judgments based on specific cases. But, but, but there is also, also something sorry. else at work. <clears throat> Parliament Hill, which is where I work, mm -hmm. is not riddled with women who all their lives have sought to bring down innocent men by, by bringing forward trumped up bogus accusations of harassment. That's just not the case on the Hill. I can tell you it's mm -hmm. not the case, and anyone who's on the Hill knows it's not the case. Are there men working on the Hill in the government, in the public service, and yes, in journalism, who act like idiots, who act like cads, who do things that 20 years ago we would have rolled our eyebrows and said, you know, that's just him being him, but which now today we realize is incredibly offensive and dangerous and, and intolerable. Yeah, there's a lot of them on the Hill. So, or at least there were. Uh, so, yeah, I, I personally, I said this in my column, uh, um, I feel 
in, in a sense, betrayed that as a, as a boomer, I thought we were making progress on this. I mm -hmm. thought we had made real advances in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, and that this kind of stuff that went on in the past doesn't go on so much anymore. But if the Me Too campaign has shown us old men one thing, it's that it does go on. Mm -hmm. And why does why have we been ignoring it? Why have we been not listening to these voices? And why do these voices not feel safe coming forward to make these allegations? Well, we know why. It's because of us. And so we have to do a bit of listening. And because there's also um, individuals who are sitting at the mothership level, it's still predominantly men. And, you know, the Gandalf report, which just came out not too long ago, they're not admitting that, that it's a problem. So I thought that report was laughable, where everybody else, at a, you know, in terms of who wasn't at that C-suite level, taking the position that, you know, sexual ha harassment is a huge systemic issue in Canada, you've got the people sitting at the mothership saying, no, it's not. So, I mean, that to me is extremely troubling. But I will say one thing um, with respect to the allegations against Kent Hare, and, I, you know, I, I've already made some comments mm -hmm. about why I suspect he stepped back but it does trouble me as an employment lawyer that he would feel the need um, if in fact the allegations are just about making some salacious improper remarks and of course not trying to undermine how um, uncomfortable it must have been for the woman who's in the elevator with him and, and some of the others that we're probably going to hear about but I think something like that from an employment perspective you know you can re rehabilitate someone like that I mean that's something that I think would fall into progressive discipline you know sh it concerns me if the public of the court of public opinion is under the impression that you know, making comments is something that should, you know, get mm -hmm. you walk to the door. You should have the chance to rectify that. Well, I, I've heard a lot of this today. There appears to be a zero tolerance policy. Feel about that what you will. But are we, as some have suggested, suggested in a situation where saying to someone, you look yummy, is being equated to forcing sex on someone, either physically or through threatening their job? But, but I think there's more to the can't hear her story. Certainly here in Ottawa, as we know, just before Christmas, he had to apologize on two other occasions for uh, offensive remarks, not of a sexual nature, but demeaning people and their station in life. Uh, I think there were three apologies in the fall from Kent Harris, so I wouldn't over re oh, uh, I would look at the broader picture as well, and I think Minutia's in part, right? I think perhaps he's stepping back, recognizing that he has been a bit of a problem to the government. If he gets out now uh, and steps back, he can rehabilitate <laughs> himself totally uh, for the Prime Minister, and, and that would be important to all of them. But you're also right, Carol, on, on comments. I, I think all of us find our, I come from the East Coast, we have a very free and open language, as you know. You come from there and you are, sometimes are colorful in the way you compliment a person or describe that particular person. I, I, I find whether this is good or bad, you impose a bit more self-control over, over the things you say. I think we're all educating ourselves, if we haven't already, we should, uh, that there are, there are most definitely lines. As John said, if, if the Me Too movement has done anything, it, it reminds us that you can't go over those lines. And the final point I'd make, and, and this may in part explain uh, the, the Patrick Brown circumstance, I think Patrick, in his heart of heart, looking at that news conference last night while he uh, appeared to be on the verge of tears, and you can understand why, his life has imploded for our nation and the world to see, may have believed some of the things that he was doing that were part of the frat house environment in which he and others in Ottawa were, were occupying, and I've occupied that world sometimes before, uh, was okay because nobody had raised it before. So he's a bit shocked. He'd been in politics for 13 or 14 years, and then suddenly uh, this was coming to the fore. Sometimes you delude yourself and believe that uh, you're beyond uh, whatever the challenges and, and movements of the society of the day are. I, I, well, I can certainly appreciate um, uh, the comments that you've made. I guess my only response to that is we have had our legislators respond mm -hmm. and say specifically that, you know, the, the comments don't need to be overt. You know, a lot of it could mm -hmm. be tone. A lot of it could be body language. And so as far as I'm concerned, as a politician, and again, I, I actually, um, you know, I, I, again, very disheartening what happened, what happened with uh, Patrick Brown. And of course, I'll say again that the allegations are unsubstantiated as it stands. But I mean, as a politician, you have an obligation to know the law. And you should know that if, you know, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, your comments may not be overt, they might not be overly sexualized, we're now having the Occupational Health and Safety Board, we're having the Human Rights Tribunal make findings that, you know, comments violated somebody's rights under either of those pieces of legislation. And they don't even necessarily seem like overtly sexual. So, I mean, the law has evolved. And, um, you know, we saw the, the changes to the Occupational Health and Safety Act back in 2016. So I think it's time for people to really, um, uh, to, to get caught up.
All right. Well, a lot of interesting conversation. A lot of questions came in Facebook we didn't get to. Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? Mm -hmm. What if the allegations are not true? I'm sure we're going to have more time to talk about this in the future. Muniza, Tim, and John, thank you for taking part in this panel today. And also thank you to those of you who joined us online. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Carol. You. Still ahead, new estimates from Statistics Canada show just